Go ahead and be seated if you would, please. All right. Well, last uh, couple of uh, Wednesday nights, we've been uh, talking about transforming truths. And uh, we were in Romans uh, chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2. And uh, if you want to cheat and open up your Bible, go right ahead. And uh, we're going to go over those verses just real quick as a reminder. These are good verses uh, for us to memorize. But if you haven't memorized, then let's say it together. All right? Give you a chance to find it. And if you haven't memorized, let's say it together. Ready? I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right? And uh, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to present ourselves uh, to the Lord as a living sacrifice, someone that God uh, can, can use. And, uh, and that's what we need to be. And it starts with us uh, in our minds. We have to transform. We have to put on the, uh, the mind of Christ, as it tells us in the book of uh, uh, Philippians. And one of the ways that we can do that, and if you would please go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4, uh, God uh, puts another verse in, in here for us. Uh, that gives us the power to uh, succeed, uh, to be able to, to overcome. And uh, Philippians 4.13, many of you probably already have this verse memorized. It says this, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That word there means empowers me. And we're going to uh, look at that verse tonight. Now, by way of introduction, it has been said that as we go through life with at least, if we can go through life with at least three great or good friends, we have uh, something special. Now, lasting companionship and good friendship is something that we all greatly desire and need. Even the, the biggest loner in, in the world still likes to be loved, still wants to be accepted uh, in that. Now, but what exactly makes a person a good friend? You ever thought about that? What, what makes a good friend? Most of us would agree that it's important, uh, characteristic uh, of a good friend is to be trustworthy. Trustworthy. What do you think about yourself? Are you a trustworthy person? Are you, if you were friends with, with someone, if you were friends with me, could I look down and say, you know what? Bob is a trustworthy guy in that. It's a good characteristic to have. Another would, uh, would rightly point out that nearly, it's nearly impossible to develop a good friendship without the foundation of honesty. We just want people to be honest with us. And sometimes when people are honest with us, we may not like it, but at least they have our best interest at heart in that. A lot of times, I, you know, uh, people give you constructive criticism we were down here uh, last Sunday night. And James goes, does anybody have any criticism for me? He says, just go ahead and get it out now. And uh, in that. And, uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes constructive criticism is good. Sometimes it's hard to, to hear, but it's good. And that's what a friend will do for us. And then another would point out that a characteristic of a, uh, of a loyal friend is dependability. Somebody that you can just truly depend on. So somebody who's trustworthy somebody who is honest, somebody who is dependable. Well, as a Christian, we have a friend that possesses all these characteristics that we, uh, that we are mentioning. He is trustworthy. He is dependable. He is faithful and true. His name is Jesus Christ. And in addition to being our Savior, he wants to be our, listen to this, he wants to be our best and closest friend. Now think about that wants to be our best and closest friend. I remember uh, early in my ministry here, uh, the first couple of years, we just kind of ran into an impasse between my, my style of teaching and, and leading and, and, uh, and some of the kids that were there. I remember preaching a message to them that I will be their friend, I won't be their buddy. Now a friend is somebody who possesses all these things. His buddy is just somebody that you hang out with and will look the other way when you're doing something wrong said, I, I'm just not going to be that. I'm not going to look another way. 
and uh, I'll, I'll be your friend. I'll, I'll tell you uh, the, the hard things and uh, not just to bring you down, but to try to bring you up. Word of God tells us in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, okay? But uh, the second part of the verse there says this, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. There is no friend like the lowly Jesus, is there? Jesus is a friend that sticks by our side each and every day. In John 15, 15, Jesus said this, Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I call you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Think about that. Jesus wants to be our friend. Our friend. I mean, all of us can remember back on the playground, everybody wanted to be that one certain person's friend because if you were that one certain person's friend, then there was popularity and all the other weird things that came with that. But really, our, our greatest desire should be to make Jesus our friend. Now, perhaps two of the greatest qualities that you appreciate in your closest friends would be this, helpfulness and trustworthiness. Now, it's always great to know that you have a friend that you could call upon at any time, day or night. If you possess a friend like that, I mean, somebody that you just know that, man, if I, if I called them, they'd be there for me. They, they'd be right there by my side. And uh, it's good to have that. Now, a true friend helps out without expecting anything in return and doesn't get upset when you need assistance. They're, they're just there. In addition to this, great friends simply keep their promises. They keep their promises. They, they do what they say they're going to do. You can rely on them to do what you need them to do. As your friend, God possesses these qualities in not only a divine uh, way, but in unparalleled ways. He is always present in every situation you face. Everywhere you go, everything you do, God is there. He already knows the situation. He already knows what's, what's taking place. He watches over you. He stands ready to come alongside you to give you strength when you need it. As your friend, he also gives you several promises in the scripture and tells you that he desires uh, what he desires to do for you. One of the most practical and uh, helpful and encouraging of all these promises is in this lesson we're going to talk about in Transforming Truths. And that is this. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now through this transforming truth, we could see that Christ gives us the power that we need for the testing that we go through, for the temptation that we face, for the challenges that God allows to come into our life. I'm glad that, that, that God was there uh, with me in, in several things that I, that I can think of. And I, I, was, I started thinking back over my life, over the things that, that God has done for me. And uh, now that I can look back, I could see the, the, the times where I thought that I was all alone. Yep, God was there with me. He was watching over me. He was taking care of me in that. He is my forever friend. He is faithful to bring me through anything that he allows to come into our life. And, and he does. Now, we're going to take this, this, this truth, we're going to take this verse, and we're just going to break it down into six sections. The first section is this, the purpose, the purpose. Now, the purpose of the verse is found in the very first word. What's that very first word? I. I is very personal, isn't it? I mean, when we talk about me, myself, and I. When you say that, you're referring to who? Yourself, okay? Do you know yourself? Do you like yourself? No, I always don't like, like myself. I don't know what I did last night. I did something bad, and my oldest daughter got on to me about it. I said, okay. I turned to the corner, and I started singing, hello, corner, my old friend. Here I am in trouble again. You've been with me all my life. You know, and uh, in that. 
But we know ourselves, don't we? We know our likes and dislikes. We know what we're really, really like. And here in this verse, it starts out with, with I. It's personal. Christ inspired Paul to write this verse to communicate something to the recipients. Guess who the recipient is? Those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. When I left to go to uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, I got letters over there. Some letters were addressed personally to me from people I knew. Then other letters that we got were to any sailor, soldier, airman, or marine. Just to anybody. People from the United States, kids, adults, were writing letters. You know what? I, I enjoyed the letters from people I didn't know. We'd pass them around. We'd read them. And, and, and sometimes we would, if we had a return address, we would answer them. I had some little girl in Springfield, Missouri that I didn't know, uh, a little girl that had been adopted into a family, a little Asian girl that used to write me all the time. And uh, her school was writing our, uh, um, uh, the Marines and, and stuff that, that, that I was with. And, uh, and I remember getting personal letters from her. But, you know, then there were those uh, letters that I got from, from, from my family. But you know what letters I looked forward to the most? Ones I got from her. Those were the ones that I didn't share with anybody else. Those were the ones that I, that, that I kept in a special spot. Because they were, they, they were to me. When we read the Bible, it's not just to any old Christian. When we read the Bible, God is writing it to us as individuals. Collectively, yes, we all have the same Bible, but when you look at what God is trying to do, he is writing to us and he is saying, listen, he says, I, as Paul, he inspired Paul to put that word in there, I. Now, we are the ones who Christ uh, was wanting to tell uh, that anything that can be done through him and this promise is meant for us personally. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can. It, it, it's me. And, God, and Christ wants that in my life. He, he wants me to understand that power. Now, when we fail to exercise uh, or to experience victory in our spiritual battles, it's often because we do not make his promises, the promises of God, personal to us. They're personal to us, the promise of God. Now, how often have we read our Bible and seen a promise that God has made and thought to ourselves, well, that's really not meant for me. Somebody out that somebody who's smarter, somebody who's is better, somebody... No, every promise in the Bible, in the book, is to us as individuals. God wants us to believe it. God wants us to heed it. Now, may we never read the promises of God uh, as his children and rush past thinking that we are the exception to the promise. That it's not meant for us. It is meant for us. I'm not, please, I'm not up here trying to, to preach a name it and claim it uh, religion. I'm just saying the promises in the book are true. And they're for us as individuals. I want you to practice something with me. Look down at your, at your Bible and look at uh, the verse again. But where you see uh, the word I in verse 13 and the word me, put your name there and mentally read the, the verse. Rick can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth Rick. Sounds like I'm talking in the third person. I've met people like that. But just practice that over and over again because it's meant for you. It's as much meant for, for little Annie down there as it is for Mr. Mead back there. That promise, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's the purpose of that verse is I. Then the second word is the probability or the possibility. The possibility of this verse is in a single word, can. Can. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. When I was in the uh, service and I got to go to hospital course school, I remember the, uh, our CO and, uh, uh, came and he addressed our class as, uh, after it formed and welcomed us uh, there as we, we started our, our 12 weeks of training. And he came in with a can. 
And on that, that, that soup can, he wrote, can do. He says, I want to let you know you're going to be challenged in these next 12 weeks. You're going to think that you can't make it. You're going to think that you can't, can't learn these things, that, that you can't do these things. He says, but I've got this can of can do, and you can do everything that we're training you to do. On the last day that we were there, when we graduated, guess what he brought back with him? His can of can do. And here, as we look at this, the Bible tells us that I can, I can, I can do it. I can get it done. And uh, it's, it's a possibility. The purpose is I. The purpose is about me. The possibility is can. Now, how often in our Christians' lives have we found ourselves not doing things for God that we know we should? God said, this is what I want you to do. And we said, I, I, I just can't. I can't. I can't do this. I can't go there. I can't teach that. I can't live that way. When God says, you can, or to make it personal, I can. How often do we fail to follow through on the decisions that we make? You ever started something, got halfway through, and then uh, you see it as a testimony of, well, I'm going to get back to that one day. A lot of times in our spiritual lives, we leave things that are undone. From this verse, we can see the potential that we need to do all things through Christ. The reason that we don't uh, do what we should do is not because we can't, it's because we won't. Let me say that again. It's not because we can't, it's because we just won't. We won't. I think of things that, that uh, my parents wanted me to do or things that they wanted me to try as a kid and I, I just kept saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And they just kept working with me and pretty soon I found out, you know what, I really can, I just wouldn't. I wouldn't try, I wouldn't do it. Sometimes I find it very humorous when uh, my grandkids are, are trying something new to eat and they're like, I, I won't like it, I won't like it, I won't like it. And their parents persevere and they taste it and they're like going, hey, this is my favorite new thing to eat. They didn't want to try it. They wouldn't do it. Well, sometimes in our spiritual lives, we're the same way. We tell God, I can't, I can't. And he's standing up in heaven going, no, you just won't. Because I say you can, that you can now, we may feel that we cannot have victory over particular struggles in our life. Perhaps you have trouble with your thought life. You don't think the way God wants you to think. You don't think in, 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 the, in, in the positive about the things that God wants for you and your life. And you're in a consistent battle with doubt or fear or anger or disappointment. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can overcome my thought life. Or perhaps maybe it's a jealousy that you have in your life. Maybe you're angry because your sister was smarter than you or your brother has a better job than you or your neighbor has a, a nicer car than you have or, and it's just not fair. God says he can give us the ability to overcome it. Maybe bitterness. You know what the number one killer in a lot of churches is? People get bitter. And it eats away at them consistently. It's almost like a flesh eating bacteria that gets inside you and eats you from the inside out. We get the word poison from the same Greek word that you get the word bitter. God doesn't want us to be bitter, He wants us to be better. And a lot of times in your bitterness or in our bitterness, the only people that know that we're bitter is us. Maybe perhaps it's discontentment. Paul said, what? I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And where did he write that from again? Oh yeah, a Roman jail cell. I'm sure it was as nice as the ones that we have here.
But a lot of times we get so discontented with the blessings of God that God can't use us when God says we can overcome. I'll give you one more. What about pride? What about our pride? There's nothing wrong with being proud. We shouldn't be proud, but be prideful. We may feel like these are such strongholds that we cannot get the victory, yet this verse says that we can what? We can. We can. We don't, when we don't see spiritual victories, it isn't because we can't. It is because we won't allow God to overrule us or govern our decisions. We say, well, you know, yes, Lord, I want your help and then not accept it or not take it. We won't allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and empty us of our pride. We won't allow him to give, we won't give our bitterness and pain over to the Lord, allowing him to use that hurt to make us better. Yet God can help us overcome. He can help us do all things and give us the strength that we need to do it. Let me say that again. He can help us do all things and he can give us the strength to do it. He wants to do that in our life. When we don't have it, oftentimes it's because we simply just won't accept it. First two words say what of the verse? I, might as well say it, I can. I can. We need to practice saying that in our life. I can. I can. I can. It's a whole lot easier to say I can't and not even try. I just can't do it. So we see the purpose, I, we see the possibility, can, do one more tonight, the practice, the practice. Next word is another single word. That's the word do. It's not enough to know the truth. You have to do your part in following the truth. There's a lot of things I know, but until I put it into practice, I'm not going to know if I could really do it. When I was going through hospital course school, they were teaching us all kinds of things. And when they would teach something, then we would practice on each other. I still remember practicing drawing blood on people. I didn't mind practicing on them. It was when they were practicing back on me. I remember when we were giving shots and we were giving shots on our fanny perpendicular. I got stuck with a guy by the name of Quackenbush. All he had to do was make an L and just stab me. He went. Because he was nervous, not realizing that he poked me three different times. When it came to drawing blood, I kept moving away from him. But we practiced on each other so that we know what it was like so that when we got out into the fleet... We knew what we were doing. We knew what we were doing. We have to follow the truth. Now, biblical, uh, biblical practice. Now, although this verse was written before the time of the Old Testament heroes, we have, uh, they would not have accomplished the great things for God that they did if they had not grasped or applied the principle that we find in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Now, principle is this. It is a fundamental truth. Let's look at some people. Look at Noah. Here you have Noah. He believed God, and for 120 years, he built an ark to prepare for rain, which he had never seen, that was going to fall from heaven to produce a flood that he had never seen over the entire earth. Now you think about it, for 120 years, not only was he building this ark and preparing for uh, all that was uh, taking place, but on top of that, he preached the message warning people of judgment. He was warning people constantly. Probably people came by, made fun of him, you know, asking him, what, what in the world are you building? Why are you building this way out here in the middle of nowhere? What kept him from quitting? God told Noah what to do, and he knew that he could do it because God wouldn't tell him to do something that he could not do. Now put yourself in Noah's place. I mean, think about it. 
I want you to build an ark. Great, what's an ark? I want you to build this boat. Great, I don't live around any water. I mean, think about that. All that he went through. How many of you have, have gone down to see uh, the ark down in Kentucky? Man, I used to think Noah's ark was big until I saw that, and it's ginormous. Took a lot of work, inside and out, for this man to build with tools. I mean, he wished he had Brother Larry's tool set. Took him 120 years. We start a project, and if it's not done in a couple of days, we're done with it. But he was faithful. Why? Because God told him to do it, and God gave him the ability to get it done. Think about Joshua. He was tasked with taking over leadership role of Moses, the greatest prophet that had ever lived. He was popular. He was a powerful leader. Not only did he have to step up to the plate and, 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 and try to, 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 to take the reins of, the, the, of this great man, but he inherited the children of Israel on top of that. He had been with Moses. He had heard their whining. He knew what type of people that they were. But yet he still did it and was tasked with taking them across the Jordan to take the promised land in battles. And guess what they got to go to first? Jericho, an impenetrable, in, 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 what, a city that you just couldn't get past. Okay? It was tough. I spit all over everything up here trying to say that word. And, uh, but think about it. I mean, how many of us would have said, I'd like that job? Now, we would say, oh, yeah, I'll take that job because we saw how successful he was. But I'm telling you, that wasn't any job anybody would have said, well, yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm qualified to do that. I think I'll take that on. Most people would say no. But he didn't quit. Why? He recognized that God had called him to these tasks and that God would give him the strength uh, to complete it. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, said of Noah, thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. That's his testimony. For Joshua, uh, he was told in Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, uh, be not afraid, neither be thou uh, dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. He, he took the promise. He said, I'll do it. Then you think about Solomon. Solomon came uh, into being a king and God said, I want you to build my temple. Gave the instructions to him specifically. He had to go uh, and had to have stuff shipped in in order to build this. Said it took him 20 years. One thing that I said, it said it took him 20 years to build his palace and everything there. It took him seven years to build that temple. What did he do during those difficult days? Why didn't he quit? Because he understood that God had called him to do this work and that he would help him complete it. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 7, verse 47, and Solomon built him a house. God said, I want you to build it, and he saw it through. Then you think of the character Hosea. Hosea was, was, was tasked with marrying a harlot. He knew that this woman was going to cheat on him. They had one legitimate child together, and she had child by other men. Think of the heartbreak that he was going through, but God was using him as an example of, of, uh, of what God felt that Israel was, had been doing to him. And Hosea stuck by it. What caused him to, uh, to stick by the stuff? There's no doubt that it was hard and, and uh, unquestionably that, uh, that uh, Hosea was hurt many times, but because he knew that he was doing what God had asked him to do, he received the divine strength to continue to do it. Think about modern task for today. If God has called you to accomplish something for him, you can do it. If God has allowed you to be the boss of a major company, he is, given, he is capable of giving you the strength to see it through. I mean, what if tomorrow the parts company that Brother Dave works for says, you know what, the CEO had to quit 
you're now in charge. Cha-ching. Okay, uh, in that. I think Dave would probably be a little bit, you know, hey, yeah, hey, great, great pay. What am I doing? But if God gave him that task, God would give him the, the ability to do it. He'd give him the ability to do it. What if God has called you to work with hurting teenagers? It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. What if God says, hey, I want you to go down, downtown. I want you to start a mission just for the teenagers that are down there. God's not going to call you unless he equips you uh, for you to do it so that you could follow through for him. What if God calls you to raise a family in this sinful culture? It's not easy to raise a family these days. And there's sin everywhere we go. You just about have to put blinders on your kids and grandkids. But you know what? God knows what type of world he's in, we're in. If he's blessed us with children, he will give us the ability to raise them in the right way. If God has allowed you to be hurt or mistreated by someone else, God can give you the ability to forgive that person and to move on with your life through his strength. Who in us in here hasn't been hurt by somebody? Some more deeply than others. But it's God that gives us the strength to overcome that, to overcome those things. Whatever situation God allows to come into our lives, we can handle it through his strength. But we have to do our part by claiming this verse and depend, depending upon his strength. We have to depend upon his strength because we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. You think about the last year that we've had, some of the trials and the struggles that God has allowed to come into our lives as individuals. It's been tough. But you know what? God's been there every step of the way. And he gives us the ability to make it through. Nothing can happen with this verse until you do something. Christian living is not passive. It needs to be vigilant and it needs to be active. The first, three verse, verse, the first three words of this verse affirms to us, I can do. Say it with me. I can do. I need to practice that this week. Because until God comes, we're living in perilous times. I can do. I can do. God is setting us up because I can do because of what he's going to do for us and in us in this verse. We're out of time for tonight. Stand together, please. Purpose, I. The possibility can. It's possible. I need to practice, do. I need to put it to practice. I can do. I can do, I can do. Tonight, you just gotta believe it. I know that there are folks in here that, that have struggles and trials, and I'm not trying to make light of those in any way, shape, or form. I'm just telling you that God says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can, I can. He gives me the ability. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you be with us tonight, Lord, as we sing a verse of invitation, Lord, help us to truly believe, Lord, that we can do all things through you. And I pray, God, that we would understand that I can because you make it possible. You give me purpose, Lord. And I just pray, God, that you would help us to, to understand that and live it in our lives this week. Just be with us as we sing. We ask your precious name, amen.